Well, two weeks ago, <clears throat> we started a series through the New Testament book of Acts, which is the story of how the early church puts into action Christ's call to go and make disciples. It's an incredible story, beginning just a couple of months after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the means by which our debt of sin is paid, and we are given victory over death. Now, when the book of Acts begins, the church consists of just a tiny number of people, but by the end of the book, 28 chapters later, some 30 years later, the church has spread. It's grown to tens of thousands, and it's taken root in every part of the ancient world. And so many of those who play a part in what God is doing are people like you and me. And because they are so much like you and me, there are things that we can learn in living out our faith today. Now, until Christ returns, the mission of the church is always go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and teaching them to obey everything Jesus commands. But that mission is not easy to fulfill, is it? For the past couple of years, we have been encouraging you, the members of this church, to identify people in your life who are outside of Christ and to build relationships with them, genuine relationships, not conditioned upon what they may or may not do with Jesus, but relationships in which you have the opportunity or they have the opportunity to encounter Christ through you through your deeds, and through your words. We've been calling those people, we've been calling that person in your life, your one life. And the plan that we've asked you to implement is called 3D1. Develop friendships, discover stories, and discern next steps. So if you've been with us for the past couple of years, how are you doing with that? How is that relationship building going? Now, I'm guessing for a lot of us, it has been a struggle. It has been challenging. Why? What keeps us from getting at it, from going and making disciples in our corners of the world? Well, I think in a word, reluctance. Reluctance. We are reluctant because a lot of us don't like getting out of our comfort zones to meet and, and to go and get to know people who, who are outside of Christ. And the longer you are a Christian, the harder it is to get out of that comfort zone because your comfort zone is made up primarily of people who are also Christ followers. <clears throat> we're also reluctant because a lot of us don't feel like we're qualified to talk about Jesus in matters of faith. We're also reluctant because we're afraid of how others might respond. What if they oppose us? What if we ruffle their feathers? What if they get upset? You know, reluctance to faithfully obey God's command is nothing new for the church. In fact, it's nothing new among God's people in general. Even the greats in Scripture showed reluctance to faithfully obey people like Moses or Gideon, or Jonah, or Esther, so many others. So if you find yourself reluctant to do what God calls all of us to do, you are not alone. In fact, today we are going to meet one such reluctant servant. His name is Ananias. He's one of a couple of Ananiases in the book of Acts. There's a bad Ananias, and there's a good Ananias. This is not the bad Ananias. Ananias. We're looking at the good one. And the good Ananias, we're told, is a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. Now there is the city of Damascus in Syria, which is about 150 miles north of the city of Jerusalem, which is the birthplace of Christianity, the birthplace of the church. Now what's significant about this is that by this time, Ananias is a Christian. He has been persuaded that Jesus is the Messiah that the Jewish people have long been anticipating. 
And the reason that is significant is because it means that the gospel message is finally getting out of the city of Jerusalem, the birthplace of the church, and into other places. Because even though Jesus had told the church to go and make disciples of all peoples, of all nations, it took the church a few years to really get engaged into spreading the good news. It would be years before they took the gospel message outside the city of Jerusalem. And why did the church finally get outside the city of Jerusalem to share the good news? Is it because they woke up one day and said, hey, you know, we need a better strategy here. What did Jesus tell us to do? We need to develop a mission plan. We need to go and tell others. No, it wasn't any of that. They were forced to by persecution <clears throat> because not everybody was happy about the growth of the church in Jerusalem. Many Jewish leaders rejected what the church was saying about Jesus. They saw it as blasphemy. And so they sought to stamp out the church. And none were more eager to silence, to stamp out the church than a Jewish leader, a Jewish scholar by the name of Saul. And the persecution becomes even so brutal, they start killing Christians, beginning with a young Christian leader by the name of Stephen. And you can read about that in Acts chapter 7. And so we read in the first few verses of Acts chapter 8, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Now what's so ironic about the efforts of Saul and others to stamp out the church is that they inadvertently spread the church inadvertently are behind the church spreading beyond Jerusalem because as the Christians flee Jerusalem, they take the good news with them and they start telling other people and the church grows. Just another example of God bringing good out of bad. But one of those cities is Damascus. That's where Ananias lives. And from these Jewish Christians fleeing Jerusalem, Ananias encounters the good news of Jesus and he puts his faith in Jesus. Now, hearing about the spread of the gospel to Damascus, a spread that he inadvertently lit the fire under, Saul heads there to try and stop the growth of the church. And so we read in Acts 9, 1 and 2, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. But on his way to Damascus, Saul encounters the last person he ever expects to encounter, Jesus Christ. As he neared Damascus on his journey, Suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Well, guess who God calls upon in the city of Damascus to tell Saul what he must do, to explain the rest of the story to Saul. It's Ananias. Now, Ananias apparently is no stranger to what Saul is up to. He might even be in hiding, kind of like the Jews in Germany under the Third Reich, but if he is, guess who he cannot hide from? God. <laughs> and the Lord calls to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on State Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Okay, so based upon everything we know about Saul, everything I've just shared, if you are Ananias, 
How eager would you be to go to that house uh, of Judas on Straight Street to find a man by the name of Saul? Would you be eager to obey that command or would you be a little reluctant? Well, Ananias falls into the reluctant category. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. Now, how does, how does the Lord respond to Ananias? Does he say, you know what, Ananias, you are so right. What was I thinking? This is a really bad guy. Horrible reputation. How frightening this must be for you. You didn't sign up for this. Let me find somebody else. You stay right where you are, safe. And safe. Is that what the Lord says? No. The Lord gives him basically a one-word reply. Go. Go, he doesn't put up with it, doesn't explain it. He just says, go. And to his credit, Ananias goes. He doesn't know what he's in for. But as we will find out, what he experiences as a result of letting his faithfulness overcome his reluctance, he gets to experience some pretty special things. It makes it all worth it. And that is not just true for Ananias. It is true for all Christ followers. Faithfulness can be so scary. But that's often when it is at its most rewarding. How is that? In what way? Well, those who are faithful, despite their reluctance, are more likely to encounter God's amazing grace. Think about it. If Ananias had given in to his reluctance, he would have missed out. He would have missed out on having a front row seat to what God was doing in the life of Saul. Now, what God does in the life of Saul does not depend upon Ananias' participation. Ananias simply has an opportunity to be a part of what God is doing. But if he doesn't, if he isn't faithful, God's going to find someone else. God is going to find someone else to share with Saul and to share with Saul that good news of Jesus Christ and to baptize him for the forgiveness of his sins. So yes, God invites Ananias to be that person, but it doesn't have to be Ananias. Just as it didn't have to be Queen Esther that God uses to save his people from genocide in the Old Testament. As her cousin Mordecai tells her, for if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. Now, does that mean if you're not the one that God uses to share with your one, that he will find someone else? And if that's the case, that God can use someone else, then why not give in to your reluctance, right? Go ahead, God. Use somebody else. If you don't need me, you know, find somebody else. But I'm not sure that's the way that it works either. After all, that would be disobedience. And even Esther was warned that if she disobeyed, you and your father's family will perish. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that God will take you out if you are not faithful to obey to share the opportunity or to, to take advantage of the opportunities you have to share the good news with people in your life. But there are consequences for disobedience, for unfaithfulness, for letting reluctance trump obedience. And one of those consequences might be that your friend, that you're one, never encounters somebody who knows Jesus. And you, as a result, might also suffer too because you might miss out on watching God's amazing grace transform someone. So through Saul, through this horrific persecutor of the church, Ananias encounters proof that God's forgiveness is truly for anybody. <clears throat> no matter how great their sin against God is, Ananias may have doubted that someone with a heart as hard as Saul's could ever change. But as a result of Ananias' faithfulness trumping his reluctance, he discovers that his doubts in God's grace are misplaced. Someone like Saul can change. 
Someone like Saul can have his heart of stone replaced with a heart of flesh. Someone like Saul, who was once the church's worst enemy, can be shown grace. And years later, Saul will talk about how unworthy he was of God's grace because of the things that he did against the Lord's church. And yet, he is walking proof that no sinner is beyond the reach of God's grace. In talking about his, his role in the leadership of the early church, Saul says this, I don't deserve to be included in that inner circle, as you well know, having spent all those years trying my best to stamp God's church right out of existence. But because God was so gracious, so very generous, here I am. Who are you tempted to think is beyond God's grace? Are you ever tempted to think that you are beyond God's grace? The truth is you're not. The only people beyond the reach of God's grace are those who refuse to take hold of God's grace. And so Ananias declares to Saul, and now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. By the blood of Christ, we are forgiven. By his wounds, we are healed. And it's in baptism that his blood washes away all our sins, past, present, and future. But there is more to God's grace, Ananias discovers, than just saving the vilest sinner. God's grace is so amazing that it can take that vile sinner, forgive him, but then restore him. Those who are faithful, despite their reluctance, are more likely not just to encounter God's amazing grace, but they are also more likely to discover God's surprises. In the words that Ananias is given to communicate to Saul, Ananias discovers that God has big plans for Saul. Yes, God saves Saul. He forgives Saul. And if that's all that God did for Saul, it would be evidence enough of God's amazing grace. But Saul's past, his opposition to the church, his persecution of God's people, his hand in the martyrdom, in the murder of God's people, that can't be totally erased, can it? That can't all just be set aside, right? I mean, isn't that enough to disqualify Saul from any type of meaningful work in the kingdom of God? I mean, shouldn't there be consequences? Pardon is one thing, but restoration? <laughs> but in the kingdom of God, the answer is yes. That's exactly how it works. Now, it's true, in this life, there are consequences to our actions. Consequences that we might bear for the rest of our lives, even though we are forgiven in Christ. But in the kingdom of God, the sinner who turns to Jesus in faith and is buried and raised up, him, raised up with him in baptism will always, have, will always have meaningful work to do in the kingdom of God. Even if that work this side of heaven is on the inside of a prison cell. Yes, that person is in jail, but in Christ, he is free. He is restored. He has purpose. There is much that God can do through that person. And that's what Ananias sees God doing in the life of Saul. Then Ananias said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. So Saul, the one who tried to silence the church, is going to be used by God to become its greatest proclaimer. Only God can write a script like that, so full of surprises. And Saul knows it, years later, reflecting on all that God has done for him and in him, he writes, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. 
But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. So not only does Ananias get to see what God is doing for Saul and in Saul, he gets to play a part in what God is doing in the life of Saul. And that's one of the best things about overcoming our reluctance to faithfully reach others with the good news. We get to see, we get to play a part in God's work. And so we read in verses 17 through 19 of chapter 9, Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. In his commentary on Acts, William Larkin identifies four ways that Ananias gets to play a part in what God is doing. Number one, he ministers to Saul through the gift of healing. He restores Saul's sight. Number two, he instructs Saul, confirming that the Jesus he encountered on the road to Damascus is indeed the Lord. Number three, he comforts Saul by addressing him as brother, brother in Christ. Number four, he baptizes Saul where Saul receives the forgiveness of sins and becomes a part of the body of Christ, the same body that Saul had once been persecuted and he is now a member of. And as Larkin says, in all of these ways, Ananias models for us the supportive, restorative role the church is to play in the lives of those who come to Christ. Now, ultimately, who is it who, who saves Saul, who forgives Saul, who adds Saul to the family, who calls him to do kingdom work? Ultimately, that's all God's doing. But God works through this reluctant service Ananias to bring all of that about. And that is true of all of the conversion stories in the book of Acts, and it continues to be true to this day. God always works through a human agent to share the good news with other people. Even in the case of Saul, it might look like that Saul was converted on the road to Damascus. He wasn't converted on the road to Damascus. God just got his attention on the road to Damascus. It wasn't until reaching Damascus and through Ananias that Saul gives his life to Jesus Christ. And in the same way, God might be working through you to reach someone for Christ. But what if Ananias had said no? What if he had given in to his reluctance to go where Saul was? It's possible God would have used somebody else, but Ananias would have missed out. It might be scary to do what God is inviting you to do, but if you are faithful, you won't miss out on encountering God's amazing grace on discovering God's so many surprising ways and playing a part in what God is doing. You know, I wondered while working on this sermon if anybody might think, you know, with all that's going on in the world right now, with all of the problems people are dealing with, do we really need another sermon about telling others about Jesus? How about something relevant? How about a message on marriage or on parenting? or on justice, or on gender dysphoria, or on addiction, or loneliness. There's so many other things that people are dealing with. What does my neighbor care about Jesus when his marriage is falling apart? Or when his kids are going bonkers, or his finances are in a shambles, or his job is in jeopardy? Why can't the church just focus on more urgent stuff, more timely stuff than evangelism? No wonder people are turning away from the church. And you know what? I get it. And I do think there are times when some of those issues and more should be addressed from the pulpit. I mean, I'm very aware of the problems that people are facing. I know hearts are breaking. I know people are struggling. I know there's a lot of uncertainty in our world right now. I've got my own problems. I've got my own worries. I've got my challenges and things that, that rattle me. 
that, that, that unnerve me, that, that shake me to my core. But it is those same problems, especially the ones without the easy answers or maybe the ones without any answers at all that point me back to Jesus to my need for Jesus and the hope that he provides, but not just hope, but the solid footing knowing him gives when everything else in my life seems to be giving way. Jesus doesn't just offer me life after death. He offers me life right now. He makes sense of life right now, especially when it's broken, especially when it's a mess. Saul encountered a great blinding light on that road to Damascus. And in that blinding light, he encountered the risen Jesus. And that encounter, though blinding him physically, momentarily, forever opened his eyes to the reality of all things, the ultimate reality. We look at this sun and see the God who cannot be seen. We look at this sun and see God's original purpose in everything he created for everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank after rank of angels. Everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. He was there before any of it came into existence and holds it all together right up to this moment. And it is this reality that in Christ in whom all things hold together that we are able to make sense of everything else or as C.S. Lewis so well put it I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen not only because I see it but because by it I see everything else so while I am tempted at times to take my foot off of the evangelism pedal, I'm pulled back by this truth that the best I can offer my neighbor is not marriage or parenting or financial advice from the Bible or perspective on current events from the Bible or answers from the Bible and all that ails us from day to day. Yes, I believe the, answer, or the Bible speaks to all of those things and more, but those are not the reasons why the Bible was ultimately given. It was ultimately given to point us, to show us Jesus. Yes, Saul's world was turned upside down because of that encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus. But it was turned upside down so that finally it could be turned right side up. And that's true for all who encounter and embrace Jesus. It's true for you. It's true for me. It can be true for your neighbor. It can be true for my neighbor if we are faithful despite our reluctance to show them Jesus, to be faithful to that same command of God to Ananias. Go. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you know the names of those and the lives of each member here who has not said, yet said yes to your son Jesus, but who desperately needs your son Jesus. Lord, find us faithful and give us the courage. Give us the opportunities to build those relationships, to take advantage of opportunities, to show them Jesus. So not only may they have hope of life after this life, but they can have life now, life on solid footing, a life established upon the foundation of your son Jesus, who makes all things new. In his name I pray, amen.